Welcome to this video lecture on land, labor, and inequality in agriculture. I'm Mike Bell, one of your three uh, instructors in Agroecology 103. And yeah, this is such an important topic. We really wanted to make sure that we took it on right from the beginning of the course. And so we understand how so important the social side of agroecology is for, well, for agroecologists. Now, one of the things that people often talk about with agriculture is that, you know, it's a source of freedom, of independence, of, of dignity, uh, control uh, over your own labor and the returns from your own labor, where you don't feel alienated from the work that you do. It's your work on your land and yeah, as Thomas Jefferson put it, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, he wrote, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. But, you know, it really is a lot of work. A lot of back breaking work very often. It's, it's work that most people actually don't really want to do. And that raises a really important question. Who, oh, there is, who is going to pick the fruit? Who's going to do that work? Well, probably mainly people who don't have a lot of other options. Something we will confront continually in this course is that agriculture commonly depends on the existence of social inequality and commonly helps perpetuate it. Let's think about Thomas Jefferson, his beautiful house, Monticello. Yeah, well, what freedom, independence, and dignity of labor at Monticello was there? Jefferson's plantation. Beautiful place, right? But over his life, Thomas Jefferson owned more than 600 people. Over 100 people were enslaved at any one time, generally around 120, 130 at Monticello. Where's the freedom, independence, and dignity there? All right, here's a uh, couple of the folks that were, were en enslaved there that we still have uh, photographs of them. Isaac Granger Jefferson, who was born at Monticello, freed in the 1820s, eventually. Or Lucy Cottrell, who was born enslaved at Monticello, uh, finally freed in the 1850s. We, we don't know much about uh, uh, the end of her life. But these were this is real people. This is, this is stuff that, that happened, stuff whose effects are still with us today. You know, slavery is a, uh, and, and the major inequalities in agriculture, well, go right back to biblical times. You know, you read it right here in the Bible. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God, wrote Exodus. And we've had millennia of structuring social life by various means so that there were people who would do that hard agricultural work and at low and sometimes even no pay. Slavery, of course, we've been talking about feudalism, colonialism, migrant workers today, uh, patriarchy, uh, so much of the really backbreaking work at agriculture is actually uh, done by folks who identify as women. And this is not, this is not work, which is easy, right? It's hard, hard work, and yet it's low paid, which raises a really important point that we should all think about in social life in general which is that your pay 
mainly reflects your social status. Not how hard you work. And these structures, we can see it um, also in any kind of agricultural uh, labor, whether it's migrant or, or, or not here in the United States. You know, we actually have different employment laws for agricultural workers, except in California, uh, where it's just starting to change. Uh, a farm employer does not have to pay overtime to an agricultural worker. And there are some other things too that limit the way that they get treated really quite unfairly. So these are real issues. They're still with us today. How can we overcome them? But there, before we get to that, it's really important that we address another major, major source of inequality in agriculture. Not just issues of how things are structured so people find themselves compelled uh, with no other good option but to, to do hard work for low pay. But another major source is the question of who owns the land. You know, here we are in Dane County. Of course, you can see Madison here. Well, look up, look up here. Sorry, one of this. I'm getting, still getting used to how to do this uh, weather forecaster style stuff. But look at that that uh, that grid work there uh, on the on the land. Why do we have all those roads going like that? Well, it has to do with the history of settlement uh, in in this part of the of the world. Col uh, colonial settlement, right? Uh, so, uh, before folks came in the 19th century and started setting up farms in Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest, there were people who had been living here before. But through a series of wars and threats of violence, uh, the native folks uh, wound up signing treaties that relinquished control, legal control of their land. And in the Homestead Act of 1862, it was said that 160 acres is going to go free to anyone who settles the land and works it. Uh, and as a result, some 270 million acres were given away. Now, if you go back to this uh, previous picture, looking at all these little squares here, now we're zooming in, and you can see there's one of those squares here. And you'll see that square is subdivided. So that square is a 640 acre square, a square mile on the side, um, and or a mile on the side, which makes it square mile. Uh, and subdividing it is 160 acres. And that's what people were, were given, what were called sections that were subdivided into these 160 acre blocks. That's colonial, that's dispossession of indigenous folks. And the legacy of wealth differences has resulted from that and has, has continued to this day. This was a huge benefit to the immigrant group, groups who were arriving in the 19th century. Really, you can think of it as the starter capital of wealth accumulation. I mean, it was intended on that, but just think how different it would be if the immigrant groups that are coming into the United States today were getting 160 acres of free land. Or if Native folks were able to retain their rights to their land. As a result, this, is, this shapes the racial and ethnic makeup of rural America today, uh, for example, in Wisconsin, but also who the wealthier groups are in the United States, both rural and urban. There, point that out there, right? Because when you've got that starter capital, for wealth. When you move to the city, you've still got that wealth starter capital to work from. Uh, it's an issue for UW-Madison itself. Our university has colonialist origins. That same year that the Homestead Act was signed, something called the Moral Act of 1862 was signed. Maybe not a very moral, moral act, Right, established the land grant universities with 11 million acres of land that was backed up by violence, uh, which led to the land uh, sessions from American Indian tribes. And our university was established uh, with a big chunk of that land 
to manage uh, and to use as the starter capital for our university. Uh, here, beginning with our original agricultural campus. That's Agricultural Hall there. And that's Hiram uh, Smith Hall. And there's King Hall over there. Wow, heavy stuff. So, is it necessary? Can we build an agriculture which really does reward virtuous labor and fair land ownership practices? An agriculture of freedom, an agriculture that works against inequality rather than depending on it. Well, agroecologists, agroecologists say, Yes, it is possible. Steve Kenyon, a grazer from Kenya, uh, from Canada, says, Steve Kenyon, a grazer from Canada, he actually uh, lives in Alberta. He says yes. And as I heard him say just a few days ago on a seminar, otherwise, I'd still be driving a truck. As far as my good friend, Mambele Kapai from South Africa with her garden, with her 30 sheep or six cows. She says, yes, I am a powerful woman now. She told me, after she died a year or so ago. Unfortunately, but while she was still with us, good friend and that powerful statement that I am a powerful woman because of her agriculture, the freedom and independence that she found in it. That's really stuck with me. For Leah Penniman from New York, author of Farming While Black, she says yes too. Stewarding our own land, growing our own food, educating our own youth, participating in our own healthcare and justice systems. This is the source of real power and dignity. Let me just leave you with one final thought. What gives people feelings of power? Money, a little bit. Status, maybe a little bit more. But growing a tomato. <laughs>